Hey everybody, Dave here. We are excited to announce our new subscription program, CyberWire Pro, that will be coming in February. For cybersecurity professionals who need to stay abreast of their rapidly evolving industry, CyberWire Pro is an independent news service you can depend on to stay informed and save time. This unique offer includes valuable content such as exclusive podcasts and newsletters, exclusive webcasts, thousands of expert interviews, and much more. Sign up to be one of the first to know of the CyberWire Pro release at thecyberwire.com slash pro. That's thecyberwire.com slash pro. Check it out. UN agencies in Geneva and Vienna were successfully hacked last summer in an apparent espionage campaign. Avast shuts down its jump shot data analysis subsidiary and resolves to stick to security. Facebook reaches a preliminary $550 million settlement in a privacy class action lawsuit. SpiceJet and Sprint suffer data exposures. LiveRamp was compromised for ad fraud. And Russia blocks Proton Mail and Start Mail. It's time to take a moment to tell you about our sponsor, Recorded Future. Recorded Future is the real-time threat intelligence company whose patented technology continuously analyzes the entire web, developing cyber intelligence that gives analysts unmatched insight into emerging threats. At the CyberWire, we subscribe to and profit from Recorded Future's Cyber Daily. As anyone in the industry will tell you, when analytical talent is as scarce as it is today, every enterprise owes it to itself to look into any technology that makes your security teams more productive and your intelligence more comprehensive and timely. Because that's what you want. Actionable intelligence. Sign up for the Cyber Daily email, and every day you'll receive the top trending indicators Recorded Future captures crossing the web. Cyber news, targeted industries, threat actors, exploited vulnerabilities, malware, suspicious IP addresses, and much more. Subscribe today and stay a step or two ahead of the threat. Go to recordedfuture.com slash cyberwire and subscribe for free threat intelligence updates. And we thank Recorded Future for sponsoring our show. Funding for this CyberWire podcast is made possible in part by McAfee. Security fueled by insight. Intelligence lets you respond to your environment. Insights empower you to change it. Identify with machine learning. Defend and correct with deep learning. Anticipate with artificial intelligence. McAfee, the device to cloud cybersecurity company. Go to McAfee.com slash insights. From the CyberWire studios at Data Tribe, I'm Dave Bittner with your CyberWire summary for Thursday, January 30th, 2020. Leaked documents reveal that three United Nations agencies were hacked last year by exploitation of a Microsoft SharePoint vulnerability. The attack began in July and was detected in early August, at which point a confidential memo on remediation was circulated internally. According to the AP and Computing, 40 servers in Vienna and Geneva were compromised, and the UN office at Vienna, the UN office at Geneva, and the UN office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights, also in Geneva, were hit. The AP says the UN described the hack as sophisticated and so probably the work of a nation-state. What the campaign actually obtained is publicly unknown. UN staff members were not in general informed of the breach. Geneva-based Ian Richards, president of the Staff Council at the United Nations, whose role is to advocate for UN employees, told the AP, quote, All we received was an email on September 26th informing us about infrastructure maintenance work, end quote. The new humanitarian, which obtained the leaked documents, calls the U.N.'s response a cover-up. Why didn't the U.N. disclose the breach? U.N. spokesperson Stefan Dujaric admitted to the new humanitarian that core IT infrastructure in Vienna and Geneva were compromised. He further explained that, quote, As the exact nature and scope of the incident could not be determined, the U.N. offices in Geneva and Vienna decided not to publicly disclose the breach, end quote. So that's one way to look at it, and possibly not an entirely frivolous way either, given that the goal of the hack was in all likelihood espionage, about which, in some cases, the less said, the better. Oh, you might ask, what about GDPR? Well, not so fast. They're the UN. They've got diplomatic immunity. The UN has said that the compromise was confined to Vienna and Geneva, 
although we'd have to offer a don't-get-cocky caution to the folks at Turtle Bay. A vast has been roughed up this week. The Prague-based antivirus firm sustained reputational damage when the company's sale of anonymized data through its jump shot subsidiary came to light. As the company put it in a blog post Tuesday, we want to reassure our users that at no time have we sold any personally identifiable information to third parties, end quote. And indeed, the reports about the incident did note that the company anonymized the data. Avast also said they had obtained consent from users to collect the information and that such consent was gathered through an opt-out mechanism. They expressed their understanding that this wasn't an optimal method and that they intended to replace it with an opt-in mechanism. But this was judged insufficient, and late yesterday, Avast CEO Andre Vilcek announced that both data collection and the jump shot subsidiary would be closed down. As attractive and useful as big data analytics might be, he and the board decided that continuing with the jump shot business was incompatible with the company's core mission of security. He put it this way, quote, For these reasons, I, together with our board of directors, have decided to terminate the jump shot data collection and wind down jump shot's operations with immediate effect, end quote. Avast had been caught last month in an embarrassing data collection squabble when Google and Mozilla excluded Avast's and subsidiary AVG's extensions from their store. After a few days' suspension, the extensions were restored. After the restoration, 9 to 5 Google quoted Avast on December 20th as saying, Privacy is our top priority, and the discussion about what is best practiced in dealing with data is an ongoing one in the tech industry. We have never compromised on the security or privacy of personal data. We are listening to our users and acknowledge that we need to be more transparent with our users about what data is necessary for our security products to work and to give them a choice in whether they wish to share their data further and for what purpose. End quote. In any case, the event indicates how dangerous data collection can be, not only to the people whose data are collected, but to the organizations that do the collecting. Avast is far from alone in struggling with privacy and data collection. The Wall Street Journal reports that Facebook yesterday reached a tentative $550 million settlement in a class action lawsuit in which the plaintiffs alleged that the social network violated an Illinois law against collection of biometric data without permission. The journal says this is the largest cash award in a privacy class action lawsuit. The journal also says that Facebook's defense that its opt-out mechanism provided appropriate consent didn't fly with the court. Matthew Doan is a cybersecurity policy fellow at New America, and he recently penned an article for the Harvard Business Review titled, Companies Need to Rethink What Cybersecurity Leadership Is. Well, that sparked our interest, so we got him on the line. For years now, I've been in the mix as a consultant and really helping organizations think through how to do this better. And pairing that as well with my role at New America, which is a think tank I'm there as a cybersecurity policy fellow, we've been doing some research and some interviews with a wide range of executives across industries. So collectively, I've seen a challenge in cybersecurity leadership pop up through my experiences and that research. And I felt compelled really to bring this to light in a way that hopefully people from a wide range of audiences can understand and develop a framework that they can do something with it. Yeah. Well, so what are your, what are your, uh, your suggestions? What, what are the things that uh, folks need to put in place to do a better job with this? So what I'm laying out here in this article is that first, the board and C-suite executives like CEOs and CFOs need to establish accountability and own this topic from where they sit to make sure that it goes well. That's the first point. But then I lay out a three-part framework for how they can be successful to ensure cybersecurity comes to life in the right way. The first part is really about setting your intent with cyber strategy from the top level of the organization. It's about understanding those unique business characteristics that you have, the constellation of partners that you're working with, the industry that you're in, your threat and risk profile, the idea here is that there is no one size fits all for doing cybersecurity well within a business, and we have to appreciate that. And then the second thing that you outline here is uh, positioning the cybersecurity function to have influence. What's involved there? 
Yeah, I'd like to break this down into three chunky items, location, authority, and incentives. From a location point of view, this is about positioning the cyber leader and the cyber organization to a place where it's going to have more influence and be able to do what you need it to do. In these days, as you see, it's making less and less sense oftentimes to slot that organization under a CIO. The management of risk compared to cost-efficient IT are very competing missions at times. So you're starting to see it go other places, sometimes even directly reporting to a CEO. Second point then is authority. We need to make sure that this is a top level mandate. We have consolidated decision rights for the cyber leader to be able to do what needs to be done. That policy makes it very clear. And then the last piece then is incentives, really bringing other people along. We don't want to just use the sticks out there and uh, be the enforcers, but use some carrots too. Uh, even creating things like bonus structures for business unit leaders to follow cyber requirements so they feel motivated. You know, I, I was uh, speaking with someone recently about uh, some of the uh, the stresses that leaders in cybersecurity experience. And one of the things that uh, that this person brought up was that um, with how things have changed, that it's possible that some of these folks may have seen uh, kind of their position change underneath of them, where the, you know, if they got hired a, a decade ago and they were hired for their technical skills, that uh, the needs of that position may have changed. And it's important to be open to the fact that maybe it's not a good fit for you. That's a great comment. I mean, the world is changing so fast. And I think the people that are able to succeed in this discipline or that are aspiring to jump into it have to have that continuous learning mindset. You have to see how the world around you is changing, how technology is changing, what businesses are doing differently, uh, even how the modern workforce is changing. So we can't be stagnant. We need people that are always sensing, adapting, and then making the call for themselves if it's still the right position for them. Uh, maybe they even go down a particular technology route if that's their passion. But the idea of a leader needs to be something far more than it used to be. Board members and C-suite executives need to embrace their accountability. I think they look downward to ensure the job gets done, but they're forgetting that it all starts and ends with them. And the strategic choices they make are going to have so much cascading impact to how successful their businesses are. So we need people to step up and appreciate that. And then hopefully the right things come to life from their great decisions. That's Matthew Doan, Cybersecurity Policy Fellow at New America. The article is Companies Need to Rethink What Cybersecurity Leadership Is. It's in the Harvard Business Review. More companies have suffered data exposure incidents. Indian airline SpiceJet had data on 2.1 million passengers in a database secured by what TechCrunch's report characterizes as an easily guessed password that was brute-forced by unnamed self-described white hats. The publication doesn't name the white hats because brute-forcing a system without permission the way they did is probably a violation of U.S. law and of who knows how many other jurisdictions' laws. SpiceJet has since taken steps to better secure the data. Krebs on Security found that Sprint's Social Care Forum, a place for customers to address issues with the telco, was being indexed by search engines, an indication that it was exposed to the Internet. He informed Sprint, which acknowledged that the forum should have been private and which then secured the exposed portion of its network. CNET reports that LiveRamp, a major marketing company and Facebook partner, was compromised when hackers obtained an employee's personal account and used it to gain access to a business manager account, which they exploited to run fraudulent advertising. The advertising, which the scammers charged to LiveRamp customers, directed customers to sites that either stole credentials or bilked them into purchasing bogus products. LiveRamp says the problem has been contained. If you're a Russian citizen interested in keeping your online communication private, you've now got fewer options than you might have enjoyed a few months ago. Moscow has blocked ProtonMail and StartMail computing reports as the Russian government clamps down on encrypted communications. And finally, ransomware operators continue to grow more insistent and aggressive. The hoods behind Maze have posted a list of slow-to-pay victims they intend to dox if the victims don't start opening their wallets. 
Twenty-five victims, several of which Computing says were previously unknown, are on the latest list. You may wonder how they're posting these things, given the international legal action that took down the page they were operating from Ireland. They've reconstituted operations and are now hosted out of Singapore. For now, anyway. And now, a word from our sponsor, PlexTrack. PlexTrack is the purple teaming platform that enables red teams to report security issues and blue teams to remediate them through a single web-based interface. PlexTrack offers public-private cloud and on-premise deployment options. You can learn more and request a demo at plextrack.com slash demo. That's P-L-E-X-T-R-A-C dot com slash demo. And we thank PlexTrack for sponsoring our show. And joining me once again is Caleb Barlow. He is the CEO at Synergistec. Caleb, it's always great to talk to you. I want to touch today on ransomware, specifically targeting hospitals, and what that can do to the business side of of a hospital that may get hit with this sort of thing. Well, hey, Dave. It's always fun to talk about some of these interesting ways to think about common cybersecurity problems. And you know, if we look at ransomware, and, and let's face it, we kind of read about this, it seems like every week or two, and it's typically targeting either healthcare institutions or kind of state and local government. So mm. I, I thought it would be kind of interesting to look at what happens in a hospital when they're shut down with ransomware, mm. and what does that impact really kind of look like? And, and the reality is it's pretty harsh what goes down. Well, take me through. I mean, a a hospital gets hit, it starts working its way through the systems. First of all, is there there a a pattern of of where it usually begins? Is there a common ground zero? Well, uh, unfortunately, the common ground zero is often healthcare. So if we look at the 621 ransomware attacks that occurred in the first part of last year, so Q1 through Q3 of 2019, Mm-hmm. 79% of them, or 491 attacks, targeted healthcare. So the first thing that happens, and we've seen this in several recent cases, is if they hit the EHR, the electronic healthcare record system, that hospital, for all intents and purposes, is pretty much down. Now, here's the next thing that happens, which is that you, you kind of close down the ER to anything that is not urgent, and you cancel anything that's scheduled. So now you're just doing the stuff where, you know, there's a life-threatening situation or an emergency. Well, now you start using lots of paper because the EHR doesn't work. Hmm. A typical hospital will create 50,000 patient notes a day. All of that now has to be done on paper. And here's the other thing to keep in mind. They don't get paid on paper anymore. So anybody's paying them, whether it's the insurance company, Medicare, Medicaid, they have to submit those claims electronically. So this literally, Dave, mountain of paper is growing, and you're dependent on the older nurses and doctors that still remember how to chart on paper. Right. I was going to ask you about that. Are we we hitting a time where it's been long enough since that was standard operating procedure that, that that legacy knowledge is fading into the distance? Well, one of our guys was asking a couple of uh, clinicians about this, and the comment was, thank God for older nurses, right? Mm, Because they still know how to, you know, if you think about when you used to write out a medical record on paper, you would document in prose. You know, I saw a patient of this age with this medical condition, and you kind of write everything out, and you know all the questions to ask. Well, Mm -hmm. you don't have to remember the questions to ask in an electronic system because the system's asking you. But of course, the real worry we all have is that one hospital isn't independent anymore. You know, I don't know about where you live, Dave, but where I am, they're all connected together. They're all owned by the same entity. Where this gets really scary, and we saw a little bit of an incident of this in Alabama. We also saw this happen last year with 100 uh, nursing homes that were using the same system. And that system, which was a cloud provider, got locked up and they all went down. Right. Hmm. So the opportunity here for a somewhat catastrophic regional impact is very real. So, okay, 
We're writing stuff on paper. We're diverting patients. We're doing things manually. But we're also starting to impact the business because if we're now a month and a half into this, we've done no claims processing for a month and a half. Is that a realistic uh, timeline for this sort of thing? Would a hospital typically find itself down for that long? Well, here's where this also gets interesting, Dave. They all seem to pay. Now, there are a few that haven't. So the Wisconsin-based VCP or virtual care provider, those 100 nursing homes I was talking about, they didn't pay. And actually, you know, there's news reports out just over the last week or two that now they're being extorted by the bad guys. So we're we're all kind of waiting to see what happens there, right? And, you know, the other challenge here is that even when you do get things back online, so let's say two months go by, you start restoring from scratch, you start bringing systems back online, you're not going to be able to capture everything that you did because you wrote it on paper. You know, a couple things happen. One, you know, the doctors probably didn't write down everything. Well, and who can read their handwriting? Who can read their handwriting? Actually, that's probably <laughs> a very real concern in this case. And the second thing, though, is you're going to start to run out of time to build this stuff, Right. Yeah. So so you really start to run into a longer term scenario that becomes really problematic. So I I think that I think the recommendation here is that, you know, continuing to just go out, get insurance and hope you can pay the ransom. That's probably not a good plan. All these hospitals now are planning on and exercising. What are they going to do as the coronavirus spreads, right? Mm -hmm. Well, what are you going to do if you get hit with a ransomware incident? Because it's going to be just as devastating to the community and could also result in a similar impact for patients. Yeah. All right. Well, it's certainly sobering information. Uh, thanks for sharing those insights. Caleb Barlow, thanks for joining us. And that's The Cyberwire. For links to all of today's stories, check out our daily news brief at thecyberwire.com. Thanks to all of our sponsors for making the CyberWire possible, especially our supporting sponsor, Observit, a Proofpoint company and the leading insider threat management platform. Learn more at observit.com. The CyberWire podcast is proudly produced in Maryland out of the startup studios of Data Tribe, where they're co-building the next generation of cybersecurity teams and technologies. Our amazing CyberWire team is Elliot Peltzman, Peru Prakash, Stefan Vaziri, Kelsey Bond, Tim Nodar, Joe Kerrigan, Harold Terrio. Ben Yellen, Nick Vilecki, Bennett Moe, Chris Russell, John Petrick, Jennifer Iben, Peter Kilpie, and I'm Dave Bittner. Thanks for listening. See you back here tomorrow.